What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years and it's just mind blowing. Birth Story, Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a -a one-of-a-kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources. If you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth, but there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story, hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula, and I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me. But I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at Birth Story Podcast. Episode 10, Daddy Boot Camp. All right, moms, because I know you're my target audience, grab your partner and get prepared for a little daddy boot camp. And I have to say, I'm really excited about this episode because if you go to iTunes right now and you type in daddy boot camp, 
uh, I might be one of only two episodes on all of iTunes with this title. Okay, so now awesome. everybody's comfortable. You've got the mics like, you know. We're cheek, <laughs> cheeked in here. Cheek, cheeked in, and you're going to go like roll. talk out. So we're just going to see if you scratch your face and you're going to hear it. And if you do this and, you know, it's okay. I mean, I we're beard we're, cream in, so hopefully it's nice We're going nice to tell everybody sleek. that we're drinking beer. So I'm Heidi with the Birth Story Podcast, and I've got three of my favorite dads with me today. So Garen, Wells, and Derek, and uh, we just grabbed some beer, and we are ready to dig into our first daddy boot camp. It's going to be incredible. So Garen, let's start. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how old your baby is and who your wife is. I'm Garen Gross. Uh, My wife is Madeline, and we welcomed our little guy, Baker, Ty, uh, into the world on May the 29th. 2.08 2.08 a.m. So. so how old does that make him now? Eight and a half months. Okay. Yeah. All right, Wells, tell us about you. Uh, Wells Vance, got a little six-week-old at the house. Uh, wonderful wife, Sarah. Um, and then Derek, can you introduce yourself? Derek Whitmire, my wife, Sarah, as well. Uh, we have a two-and-a-half-year-old, and we have another daughter that is on the way, and due date for that is April 18th. Okay, so right now we've got eight and a half months, six weeks old, pregnant, and then also a two and a half year old. So we have like so much to learn from you guys. It's going to be awesome. Let's do a cheers. Raise your beers. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. There you go. Cheers. Cheers, got it. guys. We did a lot of heavy lifting. <clears throat> All right. So the reason that we're doing this podcast today on Birth Story is because this is going to be free daddy boot camp. So we're here to talk to all of our listeners or all of our listeners' partners that they're forcing to listen to this episode of the Birth Story podcast on, um, you know, the transition to becoming a dad for the first time, for the second time, and kind of what that that looks like. So I'm going to start with pregnancy. All right. We're going to get real and I'm going to ask you some tough questions. I apologize to the wives in advance. I want to hear. Start with Garen. Um, how, and from your perspective, was Madeline's pregnancy? How did how did you handle her pregnancy? Well, before we decided to have a baby, we wanted to travel, you know, enjoy each other first, and we felt that we did that over a two or three year, no, I guess two year span leading up to her getting pregnant, and I guess it was around the August time frame. It didn't take that long. We said, "All right, we'll get the party started." And whenever it happens, it happens, and, you know, great. It'll be awesome. And when it finally did happen, it was like, holy shit, this is real now. Like, we were prepared as much as you can be. Uh, but at the same time, it was, uh, you know, the, you, you try to research, you try to learn, you try to do things to prepare yourself. But as as the process goes along, you f- you find out that there's no right book, there's no right website, there no everybody's got fucking advice for you. And at the end of the day, you you make it make it your own. Yeah. So, but her pregnancy was awesome. And it only took how long did you try? Where I mean, it started like in August at or around her birthday time, I guess, and then bam, by like middle of September. So like, I told her, I said. Man, you can get get a lot of mileage out of this. That's my next question. When was the next time you had sex after you found out she was pregnant? Uh, Well, she had uh, morning sickness for as she and I asked her to truly tell me what what did it feel like? A 24 seven hangover was her response. Uh, And it lasted for four and a half months. I, I think the last time there was like a four and a half month span might have been <laughs> some fucking virgin, right? But at the same time, it's like I, it, trying to keep her at the forefront. And, and of course, if she's not feeling good, yeah, you know, even times that I'd even pick and prod a little bit, you know, she, if, if you want to, we can. And it, How did you help her when she wasn't feeling good? I just... You hate to say being her servant, but just kind of as if she was sick. So anything that she needed and a lot of times just being personable to bring her something home or, you know, if it's 
her favorite drink or food or just to make her feel comfortable or to take care of, obviously, uh, I mean, the five love languages book. She's a big access service person. That's her, like, here are the other four, and then access service is way up here. And she is just completely you – know, anything that I could do, like if it's laundry, and we're, we're a team no matter what. But she, I'm sure, really – appreciated me taking it a step further trying to basically take almost everything off the plate so she could focus on just resting and feeling better awesome and she was she working throughout her pregnancy yeah she did yeah worked for her dad and her brother still so uh okay so wells i know i mean and sarah was already on here but from your perspective like how did pregnancy go for sarah so i honestly thought it would be a big change big mood swing for her uh, she honestly stayed pretty much the same even kill throughout the entire time. Yeah. I was waiting for her to eat the pickles and ice cream and random things that she wanted. But, you know, she was uh, more or less just kind of moved from, like, spinach salads to my kind of style, pizza and beer and burgers <laughs> and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the pregnancy, she she really didn't change too much overall. So it was really nice and kind of easy for us to get into it we've been together 10 years at that point okay and uh you know we were ready to have our first so and she didn't really suffer from a lot of the sickness or anything like that and so no morning sickness none so wells what was that moment like when you found out that you guys were having a baby like how did she tell you she was pregnant so we had a couple friends coming over that night and we were going to go all out to eat and she had just taken a uh pregnancy test one of the cheap ones we had gotten off like amazon like a hundred of them and uh (laughs) she tested it and then ended up with like the blue lines and she was like oh crap i think i'm pregnant so she went and got like three more of them and did the same thing and she was like wells i I, we're pregnant and i was like all right you know (laughs) i was so excited yeah so I was like, well, let's go, uh, you know, get one of the nice ones from CVS or whatever. Go spend 40 bucks on and uh, ended up same thing. So we kind of, you know, felt real blessed at that moment. And um, it was, uh, you know, not nine, nine months from there. And so I'm going to ask you joy. the same question. then. so Garen's wife was a little bit sick. Sarah didn't really have a lot of that sickness. So when was the next time you had sex? So it really didn't stop. I think it was even that night. Okay. Like a little celebratory go. Okay. So just right there, that's a really good point for anyone who's listening. Like dads that are listening is like, hey, your wife may feel great, but she may not feel great either. So like really kind of finding that balance. Um, So Derek, tough question to you now. Go. So um, we already interviewed you a couple of weeks ago on what it was like, but let's just kind of recap because... Derek, you this Derek and Sarah had an unplanned pregnancy, and so just kind of share um, your reaction and and how her pregnancy went from your perspective. Yeah, yeah. Can everybody hear that scratchiness. Hopefully, it's so. My um, reaction wasn't good, mainly because we had been married for five or six months, and it was a massive shift. It was. It didn't feel like the marriage was going to last to me. So. You know, and a lot of guys I've talked to have, have said that they've experienced this. I I thought it was a hoax or something, but I and you know even people who lived with their spouse before they got married had told me you know yeah it changes when you get married. And I'm like, I mean, I've known this person since we were in college, so I don't really see that. Man, I mean, the expectations were just different, like totally different, and. Uh, So it was kind of a scary time and it wasn't talking about kids wasn't anywhere in the picture because I didn't see her still wanting to be married to me a a year from then. I thought, you know, well, I was going to do my normal just wait for them to leave kind of thing because I hate change. So I'm like, <laughs> she seems miserable. Eventually she's going to, she's going to dump me and I'll be back to square one and you know, whatever, back to the drawing board. But, uh, she was like, but hey. then she was pregnant. Yeah. And, um, that was terrifying. So I reacted in like every bad way imaginable initially. But you guys liked each other a little bit if you are still having sex. Um, 
Yeah, but I mean... <laughs> if a baby came to be. Yeah, I no. can't even... I don't know. I think it was a makeup sex thing. <laughs> like, we had one of our knockdown drag outs, and then, and then we made up, as we do, and there you go. But... So let me just ask you that same question that do. So how was her pregnancy, though, like from your perspective? Do you feel like she was healthy and felt good or was she sick? How was she doing? She was miserable. She hated every second of it and was, you know, and also dealing with the fact that she didn't have for the first six weeks or a couple months a supportive husband. Uh in the sense that, I mean, I just didn't know what was going to happen. It felt like she was disconnected from me to begin with. And then you talk about adding being pregnant to that and all the fear and anxiety and unknowns that come with that. I was a distant second, like not even anywhere on her radar as far as being concerned with me and what, you know, it was her and the baby, which is probably makes sense of what it should be. So let me stop right there. Wells and Garen, did you guys ever feel like you were a distant second to the pregnancy? Like for me, uh, from the beginning, like I said, I mean, Madeline and I grew up in the same neighborhood when we were kids. We've known each other for 20 years. Uh, she was my girlfriend, you know, on and off through middle, From middle school, school and elementary school, the whole nine. <laughs> I always tell people I've loved her since I was little. And so we've always just kind of had, we were super really good friends too before that. Uh, so it, it was hand in hand. We experienced everything together from start to finish. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, no secrets. She would tell me how she felt. That type of deal. So. I'm just going to call you out right now because let's just do it. Let's just get the scratches out because oh, I, I coached Garen that like if you scratch your beard, everyone's going to hear it. But then he's going to do it the whole time anyway. So let's just do it. Let's just just have a beer scratching moment. I'm going to leave my Come hands on. on the table. No, do it. Come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just giving you our time. You so, um, Wells, like same, you know, question to you. Did you feel like you were coming in second place or did you feel like a team? You, you know, I definitely felt like. Like we were Sarah, Sarah's more of a, a lead person so I just kind of let her do her thing and um, I you know I just tried to be the supportive person but she would never really tell me if there was a level of pain anyway she's just uh, one of those people that you know she's already ran a marathon she's you know has no level of um, no, you know tolerance she puts up with me daily so it's uh you know, yeah, you're so funny. His wave hiked Mount Kilimanjaro without training for it. She, <laughs> so, hiked, she hiked Crowder's Mountain. That was her training. Crowder, <laughs> which is for anyone who's not in the Charlotte area, Crowder's Mountain's like what elevation two two thousand <laughs> to train for. I don't even know what the elevation is. Nineteen thousand yeah, for Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> there in Machu Picchu. So. Yeah, so she's she's pretty tough. Okay, so my next question is, um, and you guys, anybody can chime in at any time, but when did you feel like you became a dad? I, I'd say for me it was probably closing in within that eight-month period. Okay. When I was starting to put together, like, uh, you know, the stroller and starting to put in that, I was starting to see a bedroom come together for, like, a little um, felt my wife's stomach kick the first time I was like wow this is getting kind of crazy right now yeah I was like this would be pretty surreal here in the next month or two so yeah so you really started to kind of feel that like dad miss it was beyond the bond of hearing like the heartbeat um at the doctor's office I mean it was more or less coming coming to the fact that I'm getting ready to have something in my arms yeah so. cool the when- whole process was fascinating for me uh but like you said, hearing the heartbeat and the little things leading up, putting the things together, the the baby shower, even though up until that point, you don't see them. But once you actually see them, it's still at the point was like, is this real? Like, is somebody going to take their baby back with them? Uh, for me, it was getting in the car to go home and it's like they're letting us leave this hospital so like as your son's coming out of your wife's vagina and you're watching that go down (laughs) it still wasn't real well it was real it was like i mean it just it didn't sink in completely uh i mean holding them the experience like i said was fascinating but it was the ride home when we were leaving all the help and 
Heidi, you've known me for quite a few years now. I'm never short on questions. And I used and abused the nurses with questions and stuff in the process because you want to be for sure. This is this is the first time for me and her. And Madeline, like, give me an example. Madeline's introverted, you know, so it's yeah. it's more of, uh, you know, when. <laughs> so, would, like, were you afraid, like, how to put him in the um, like, car seat or? How to hold him or how to swaddle him. Or the how to, s- swaddling was one of them. The smartest baby on the block, I think, is the name of the book. One of them that... Happiest. It, the, happiest, the happiest, happiest baby. The five <laughs> yeah. S's. And swaddle is one of the S's. I know, of course, you can look at the diagram. You, you can watch the nurse. But every time, Madeline would be like, swaddle him. You know, and I'd... I'd ask the nurse to come in real quick. Can you show me one more time <laughs> so I know how to do this? So, uh, but Did you I'll, watch any YouTube videos on swaddling? Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. So, but the end all be all is when we got home and we got the ones that have the fucking Velcro and you just pow. <laughs> <laughs> swaddle is done. Swaddle is done. But it was, like I said, leaving the hospital and it was me and her and he was in the back seat and it was like, wow, this is my family. Yeah. Derek, Derek, when did you feel like a dad for the first time? It's an evolution. I mean, I think the bigger her stomach got, you know, the more it seems like, man, there's really a human in there. And, um, you know, I would say, I mean, it's hard not to have a conversation about this without at least observing, uh, you know, when does a life begin type of a thing which is very controversial and very personal to a lot of people that's all right go there um well i mean i don't know i don't ha- i don't have a strong opinion about that but i do know that like most things that are very con- like um exist on a spectrum and and everybody's different and has different feelings and some people have really strong feelings it changes. It evolves. How you think today is not going to be how you think five years from now, 10 years from now, once you've gone through an experience. And, you know, to watch my wife, who I didn't know loved me, uh, you know, or didn't know if it was going to last or whatever, go through an experience like that and watch the biology of all that happen and before my eyes, um, you know, it, it, when she just looks at you and tells you she's pregnant and you don't think you have a great marriage, that's a different thing than somebody that, okay, so my wife, you know, is a go-getter. I mean, she, she, we met in college, she got two degrees in less time than it took me to get one. She got her PhD before she was 25. And then she's like, she is a little bit of a control freak and that intimidates me a little bit, but we know each other. So it's like, we had a great dating relationship and, you know, I was very attracted to her for lots of reasons, but, um, there's, she's got a force field around her and, uh, that, that just came crumbling down with the experience of growing a child inside of her. And that was very attractive to me. And that, that, you know, a lot of ways saved our marriage because I was like, that vulnerability is something that I needed to see. And, and it let you in. Because she needed you. She had to lean on you. Yeah. Because I'm saying, like, so that everyone who's listening here, you guys are in a great place now, and baby number two is on the way. And so I want you to answer the question also from the second baby perspective, because now you're already a dad, and now she's pregnant again. So was it more real earlier, or was it still see when when the baby her belly was growing again no i mean it's totally different because i wanted to have a sibling for my shia and uh and uh, you know a, a a bigger family just i just wanted that desperately and and knew that the timing was never going to feel awesome you know but i had to struggle to get my cfp certified financial planning designation if, you know, and that's a two year process. And I failed the first time. So it was longer for me. And, and I wanted to get over that hump because that put a lot of stress on her, uh, while I was going through that. And, uh, the idea was if I got over that hump, then it'd be like really uh, feel good about it and exciting. And that's exactly what it was. I just didn't know, like Garen, you know, and I know you will have and have had people, 
that struggle to get pregnant and it's really really uh not talked about thing i don't know why it's taboo but like so many of our really close friends uh it becomes really emotional you know and nobody here had a fertility journey right everybody got pregnant pretty easily yeah the next time i do a daddy boot camp i'll probably do like three dads that had a fertility journey so we had a false sense of security because of all seeing all that we're like i was like this is gonna take a long time it's gonna be a great fun time (laughs) you know trying and trying and trying well yeah what are you about do you have something to tell me oh no 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 i mean as in like he he talked about like i'm like i was like oh my gosh and now saying yeah first try man (laughs) the gates are open we can have some fun now first try yeah Yeah. it was um okay so we're i'm gonna jump off topic real quick and go to something because you mentioned your job and being a CFP. And I know that Garen, you work for a pharmaceutical company in sales. Wells, I feel like you're in sales for something. What do you do? I work in logistics. In logistics. Okay. So what was everybody's like return to work plan? Like how much time did you get off work before you had to go back? Uh, With our pharmaceutical company, uh, you get four weeks or it's 28 calendar days. So it's basically a full month. Uh, and from the day that the baby's born. So four weeks at home, and it, it, I have to say, and I know that it is more advocated than it ever has been, and rightfully so. I, I would wish that everybody could experience, from a, from a dad perspective, and it's sad that some moms go directly, close to directly back to work, but to spend every moment of those four weeks to wake up and grab them and to take every nap those four weeks were the best and when i went back to work i had no guilt and i was ready it was did you feel bonded unbelievable so family bonding time is what it's called it was legit yeah for me yeah personally wells what about now i know let's tell this story okay let's just let's just rip the band-aid right open because Trip, his little baby, was born on December 31st, 2018. Oh. And then what happened on January 1st, 2019? January 1st, 2019 would be two weeks for me to have paid off at work. Um, so I missed it by 10 hours from getting uh, paternity, uh, paternity leave. leave at my company. So that uh, For everybody listening, let's just, like, let's talk about how bad that sucks. Right? Like, so it's awesome because your baby was born and he's healthy, but you had to go right back to work? So, for I, I am very fortunate. I do have, you know, six weeks of vacation each year. Okay. Unlike a lot of people, I've been at the same company for a long time. Yeah. Um, but uh, my, my in-laws actually were there, so we come back from the hospital on Tuesday. Wednesday, I stay, stay home, and I go back to work Thursday. So, I mean, I'm, I take one day off. Wow. Okay. And, and go right back at it. Okay. And then you, but you have those vacation days available. You can use them whenever. Yeah. I guess more or less was probably going to use it when Sarah goes back to work at the end of March, which is three months. So yeah. take a couple of weeks off with them before we put them in uh, some kind of. Yeah. Do you feel like you're missing something? Like, do you feel sad about that? So I, I currently enjoy every little morning waking up, snagging them, changing his diaper, Hanging out with them a second and then hand them off to Sarah. And then every night when I come home, it's my time and his time because Sarah is like, oh, I can go to the grocery store. I can go do this. Yeah. So I get on my full bond time right there. And I'm just like, at that at that time, I get more of his awake time Yeah. than him just the napping time. Because then at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, I can go put him in my arms and he's trying to take a nap. And yeah. we can both go to sleep early. So. so you guys are really like tag teaming it, yeah. you know, like you're, you know, she's got him during the day. Then you've got him in the morning and at night. That's kind of a nice balance to you to still get that bond. And then Derek, does um, your company, do they offer paternity leave? Yeah, it's uh, it came into place a few months before Shia was born. So okay. that was a really good timing. I had the the other end of that spectrum where it worked out perfectly and uh some of my friends actually were pregnant at the time when we found out that that was the new policy and uh it was pretty because it's six weeks and you can split it up i i think i did like a month or three weeks and then 
took some time. But yeah, it's interesting the spread, right? So you Vanguard gives you six weeks. Wells, your company just implemented two weeks. Just implemented. Um, AstraZeneca gives four weeks. I think that's pretty standard in that industry. And then the banking industry gives 12 weeks. Yeah, my dad works for Bank of America, and he gets 12 weeks, you know, when or the guys that work under him. So. Yeah. So it's really like just to kind of like let's just put that out in the world. We have a huge discrepancy between paternity leave in this country, depending on what um, company you work for. And then I'll go back to Derek because you got the most time off. So when you got, went back to work, did you feel like super bonded with Shia? Like you got, uh, or did you want to stay home longer or were you ready to go back to work sooner? I, I was enamored with her. I was amazed at the whole experience. I remember the day she was born, we had been in the hospital for 24 hours. I woke up watched the sunrise from our hospital window and took a photo of it because I was like, this is the day I become a dad. Like, this is a really big deal. And I was crying and like, it was a great experience. And I loved having her in our home and I knew, but it was really, really hard also for Sarah and me. I liked holding her, you know, and, but really I was, I was in another place too mentally. I, I, I just was foreshadowing you had to pass the CFP. The needs of our family, and yeah, it was yeah. tough. No, that's a big deal when you have like a big stressor or a big deadline at work, and you have a baby that's on the way, and you know that getting that next promotion is going to provide a lot more for your family. Like, I think it's pretty admirable. All right, so let's let's get into the, the delivery. You know, I have the benefit of two of these people. I was their doula. I mean, God, Aaron, what is wrong with you and well, Madeline well, and for I'm, not hiring me? I'm I, will, just I will tell you this, <laughs> Madeline, and now, I, you know, I do... I do a lot of our, the talk. She's introverted. I'm extroverted. Uh, but when she talks, I listen. <laughs> you know, I learned that. <laughs> so. so she did say, I would I would actually have Heidi as my daughter because she's a very private person. But we actually talked about this earlier today of just how the childbirth process changed her whole mentality around privacy when it comes to that. So. <laughs> Uh, it gets you'll thrown out the window. A, you'll probably be getting a call this well, next go Well, I did get an opportunity to talk to you guys on the phone a couple of times uh, to prepare for the birth. And, you know, just they had questions that came up. So that was really good. But just dive in. Tell me about the day of delivery from your perspective. Like, how did it go down? All right. So uh, Memorial Day weekend. And yeah. uh, it's on a Sunday, so it's you're teetering. Well, I want to have a couple cocktails, but I don't want to go too deep because tonight could be the night. Uh, her best friend was at the lake, and uh, her sister-in-law was there. She's a, a pediatric nurse, and she said, baby's going to be a while. <laughs> the baby's going to be a while. <laughs> the baby came that And you night. were like, drink. Well, I was so. like, I want to enjoy some cocktails, enjoy the lake. And uh, that next morning, in between 4 and 5, her water broke. And then I was like, are you sure? I've never seen what a water break looks like. So she's in the shower. And, and I'm like, she. show you. Yeah. And so she like, you know, kind of swaddles her legs. And I'm like, oh, okay. Water's <laughs> broke. All right. Like her, she showed you her wet pants. Or No, she was in the shower. Yeah. And then, I mean, you know, kind of spread her legs a little bit. Oh, and, and you it could just, see it you coming out. You could see it coming okay. out. So Got that was it. Like the first experience there. <laughs> and you're like, that's not pee or shower yeah, that water. Is, that's okay. All right. That's the real deal. Okay. So, was she in labor or did uh, her water break first? It, her water broke first. And she wanted, we called because she wanted to hold out as long as they would let her before we actually went to the hospital. So okay. uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was around. Uh, six or seven, we get to the hospital, and they get her checked in, and uh, she doesn't have Baker until that next day at 2.08, so it was a 22-hour... 2.08 a.m.? A.m., so it was 22-hour okay. labor process, uh, but even when we were there, so of course, I have a hundred million questions, and I'm like, is she experiencing contractions yet? And, of course, they've hooked her up to the belt, and she's explaining to me, saying, she's actually had some, she probably just doesn't feel them yet. Now, Madeline, of course, has Von Willebrands, which is a blood disorder where your blood doesn't clot. I hope I've said that properly. Okay. But uh, so no epidural. The OB like did not, she knew going into birth, an epidural wasn't was an option. Not an option. Yeah. Okay. So it was wow. from the mental perspective. Odd. Yeah. So it wasn't an option. Didn't want to risk the bleeding on the spine. Yeah. 
So she didn't, it was going to be all natural. So that's going in. And then, of course, I mean, well, I told you, she, she, she's she got a poker face. You know, I don't care what it is in our relationship. And I told her I, I, can, I can read things pretty good, but I'm still trying to figure her out sometimes. But from the pain perspective, uh, by the time they started Pitocin, and she wanted to get the contractions really rolling, kind of get the process going so we didn't have to have a C-section. Yeah. And uh, so she... That would also be a problem for a clotting disorder. It, I, yeah. So it's just all natural was the way that she wanted to really go. And then once the Pitocin kicked in, that's when, uh, you know, I could start to see a little discomfort. And then... The so part- they ended up inducing her because her water had broken and her contractions really weren't picking up. It sounds like. Basically, I mean, or her contractions did start to pick up, but then they They just needed them to go a little bit faster because their water was broken. Yes. So uh, once that happened, I think it was, she was like one centimeter dilated. And And she was like, I have to have a natural childbirth. Yeah. And it's like, see, they do with the vaginal check. And then while she's up there, the OB kind of like, I could see her give that, oh God, look on her face. And she was in pain and she kind of, I guess, stretched her out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and she said, she said, she's three centimeters now. You know, by midnight, we could be looking at it's it's go time. Yeah. So, you know, she all, all natural, but towards the end, I mean, it was brutal. I could tell. And there, there's were, no. What were you doing to help her? There was no. And that's the <laughs> thing. It's like. There is nothing you can do, and there's never been a more time that I felt helpless. Uh, you know, you can tell her and talk to her and comfort her as much as she can, but I know that's a mental thing. Yeah. And just being there for her, though, and letting her know I'm I'm right here if you need anything. So it was an experience. 22 hours is a mental, that's mental strength. Well, I, Sarah's was even longer than that, right? Sarah's was like somewhere closer to 30 hours, too. And when you get the Sarah, Derek Sarah, sorry, I forgot we have two Sarahs here, but Derek Sarah was about 30 hours. And then uh, Wells, your Sarah was, that was a three, three and a half hours. Get so, out of here. We'll get to Wells, we'll get to Wells in a minute. Just yeah, to, so to, like, finish, to finish up Madeline, she, once we reached a little after midnight, she came back in. And of course you were, I mean, we went to the hospital a long time before that. So everybody's exhausted and she's like, it's go time. It's time to push. And the coolest thing, I mean, it's like a movie. The OB finally comes in and, like, she throws her arms out and they, like, just put her body armor on, right? <laughs> so they slide on the and scrub. she steps in her boot things and then pulls her little <laughs> shield down. And I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. She's like, I'm about to get bled on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, she, and then she slid shield right under. From blood. From blood. She sl- and fluid. Oh, and the nursing staff, the bedside matter was unbelievable. Uh, yeah. We just still, to this day, rant and so rave So don't talk about, I, let's interject right here. Yeah, Do sure. not say the name of your doctor. Or no, your no, doctor. no, 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 no. We're just trying to keep everything, you know. Pushing lasted what? for 45 minutes. Whoa. Okay. That was pretty fast for a first time. Yeah. And, but it was, it felt like five minutes. And once okay. he was here, it was just. Did you look like some dad stay up at the head? Were you a head dad or were you a vagina dad? So there were two people in the room, her mom and me. She okay. said her mo- mama could stay north of the equator, and I was more than welcome. I wanted to be up in up in there as much as I could. Okay. I wanted to ex- have the full experience. <laughs> so if they would have let you, like, catch Baker, would you have caught him? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you would have. If okay. they would have let me put the mineral oil on and during the process, I would have been game. <laughs> and stretched her perineum? Oh, whatever. Oh, I my was, God, I, I was this. just watching the process. And it was fascinating. It's okay. The woman's body is... Do you watch surgeries on YouTube? Is I have it, Are you one of those kind of guys? I, I watched a C-section just so I would know yeah. in case... We would have to go there, you know, in in advance. But yeah. luckily, twenty two yeah. hours, and she was unbelievable. I have, I've always respected my wife, but it's complete a, a newfound and respect. She went completely natural yes. with pitocin. Yeah, man, high five to Madeline. Let's take a drink for Madeline. Yeah, whoop, hey, drinks. I'll, I'll take one. Everybody, I'll go. Hey, bartender. I'm getting a little parched over here. You need another one. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on, everyone. I have to move away from the microphone and uh, pass a beer. I am the bartender. Does I'll anyone else? That. Okay, let's do to our. I'm going to keep this in here to our audience. Here you go, Wells. 
sliding them across the table. I'm on a different speed than let's, you guys tonight. Let's tell everybody what we're drinking. Here. Let's give yeah, a shout out. What is this beer we're drinking? Lagunitas, I think. Lagunitas. Uh, the Indian, IPA. Or Indian Where is this sorry. brewery from? San Diego. San Diego. Cheers. To Near San there Diego. somewhere. I'll, I'll see if they want to sponsor the episode. <laughs> there you go. I like that. <laughs> on... Uh, Hey, it's Heidi. I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know about a free resource that I've created for you at birthstory.com. All you have to do is go to birthstory.com and then click the tab that says the workbook. Once you put your email address in, an entire resource library of all of my secret sauces are available to you for free as my thank you for listening to the Birth Story podcast and being part of this community. At birthstory.com, under the workbook, you will find a birth plan template, articles on circumcision, delayed cord clamping, flipping a breech baby, packing your hospital bag, acupressure points, placenta encapsulation, and so much more. There are over 20 free articles ready for you to download at birthstory.com. Now let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, Wells, uh, let's hear about this three and a half hour labor from your perspective, so, because you're funny. New, new <laughs> so. Year's Eve, uh, you know, I, I woke up, I actually had to go to work for, I don't know, six or seven hours. Um, and I, I woke up, had this weird feeling. I was like, you know, something's not right here today. So I actually stayed home uh, that day. Um, come about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, Sarah was like, Wells, I, I'm starting to have contractions, and I was like, "All right, go time. Let's <laughs> let's do this." So she starts walking up and down the stairs. She's starting to get real active, and she's like, "Let's get this thing going." And I, you know, and she comes up to the bedroom about eleven thirty, and I'm like, "Sarah, how are you feeling?" She's like, "I need to go sit down." She goes down, and sits in the bathroom for a while. I call Heidi, and I'm like, "Heidi." I, I think we're about to have this baby here after a while. Sarah's having some really hard contractions. She's like, all right, I'm at the mall. I'll come right back by there and see you guys. Um, she comes in there, and she's like, you guys got to get going to the hospital here in a second. Well, once these contractions get like less than you know three minutes, go. You're four miles from the hospital. And Sarah obviously waits till like it's two minutes apart. Uh, she's still at this point had not broken her water. Uh, we get all the way to the hospital. We pull in the same time in the hospital as Heidi's pulling in. Heidi grabs a wheelchair, and they take Sarah, go running past security. Um, I go and try to find a parking spot. Literally had nowhere, to, didn't know where to go in the hospital. Well, let's talk about the car ride, though. So, like, what were you thinking? You were like, oh, my God, my wife's been in labor for 10 minutes, and we're on our way to the hospital, and, like, what, what was Sarah like? What was she acting like? Like, what she, was it? She was sitting there. She, like, uh, rolled down the window. She was trying to listen to music and just trying to get in this calm, like, little spot. Um, you know, she didn't want to talk whatsoever. And I was like, Sarah, you know, what can I do? She was like, well, all I know is if my water breaks in your brand new Suburban, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and... And I, I am not much. <laughs> she one. was keeping her water in for you. Yes. So. In, any extra fluid, I am not a fan of. I don't like blood. I don't like. I mean, I am. I, I kept as far away from uh, the south of the equator as I could during the <laughs> during the uh, pregnancy. So um, you know, we get into the hospital room. I'm, you know, I hold her hand. I try to stay up there as far up there as I can. Not look down there. Uh, Sarah's over there squatting, trying to get ready to have this baby. I mean, I think within 40 minutes of being in the hospital room, we had the baby. Um, you know, the doctor was like, do you want to cut the umbilical cord? And I was like, hell no. Like, just <laughs> go away. And and my wife's over there like, I'll cut it. And I'm like. <laughs> That's what my wife said, too. <laughs> That's awesome. So. <laughs> so. Did you cut the umbilical cord, Gary? I did. Okay, and then Wells, you did not. And then Derek, did you? Sarah wanted to, but she was too tired, and, and they offered it to me, and I was like, that's that's your job. I don't Oh, that's so funny. Okay. <laughs> so, well, so start to finish, your wife was, what, three and a half hour labor yeah. until your son was in your arms? Yeah. 
And then, um, like, so just tell me, like, what was that when you saw him come out for the first time? Like, my best friend had actually had his baby like three months before head. And he, and this one, he's one of those guys that just reads everything and just has to know everything about pregnancy. He was like, Wells, I read everything there was to be about pregnancy. But then he came out with a cone head. And he was like, I didn't know babies had cone heads. So, you know, I was sitting there kind of waiting for Trip to come out. You know, he pops out. Big cone head. He pops out, and it wasn't that bad. And I was like expecting the uh, the movie, like I mean the conehead movie, yeah. like to come out. <laughs> some of and, them look like that, yeah, and some of them do. So I was like, you know, here we go. I was like, we got all our fingers, got all our toes. We don't have a conehead. We're we're good to go. Yeah. So he's cute. Yeah. Okay. So Derek, talk to me about. Sarah, Sarah's long, she had a long labor. So just tell me from like your perspective though, like how, how delivery went down. <laughs> it was a long day. It was just crazy. She, she labored. I mean, um, most of it was because of whatever, I think you, you know, what condition or cyst she had that like to where she had some scar tissue on her cervix, so it was yeah. um, stopping her from progressing. So, yeah, that's why, like, it was, you know, a lot of intense contractions. And, like, we're thinking, you know, we we used your expertise and knowledge to try to time going to the hospital. I mean, she went into labor uh, at midnight. And we're like, okay, well, we know that it's still going to be a really long time before we go to the hospital. She gets in the bathtub. Just like, she's never had a contraction before. So that was like scary for both of us, but we're like, okay, you know, there's going to be a lot more of them. It's a a process. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, she did really, really well until, until you could, you came over at like six in the morning and walked around the neighborhood a little bit. And we're like, uh, I mean, to me, that's crazy. Like already been six hours of, just nothing going on except she's timing them out and she's all meticulous about everything and I'm just like all right here you know excited but also knowing that you know we got a long road ahead of us and I don't really know I'm just here to listen to what she says she needs and what Heidi says we're supposed to do and you know maybe drive the car to the hospital at some (laughs) point but uh then we ended up I don't know I think Sarah and I argued about this on your podcast last time about what time I literally, it was so crazy. I couldn't remember if it was, you know, early, like late morning or we didn't go to the hospital until like noon or one o'clock. I don't really remember, but I think it was more in the afternoon. Okay. So So that's a long damn time to be (laughs) just sitting around the house contracting and thinking that you want to time it so that you're not at the hospital too early and you're just going to have the baby when you get there. And um, we get there and it seems like she is having a baby in seconds. I mean, to me, just based on the level of pain Pain. she was in and um, it was intense. And And they were like, sorry, you're one centimeter guy. (laughs) (laughs) A long way ahead. (laughs) Because she had scar tissue on her cervix, so her cervix wasn't opening. So she ended up having to have an epidural so that they could open up her cervix and you know get it going but but yes I can understand from your perspective how you would because from my perspective I remember saying to his wife I remember saying I think we need to go to the hospital because if you were progressing things would be coming out of you like a little bit of blood a little bit of fluid maybe like your water like I could tell she was having major contractions but I could tell nothing was happening and I was like we're gonna have to go intervene which was you know what we ended up doing so when they figured that out the doctor said you know I know you're wanted in your birth plan to natural childbirth and she's a tough person she's has her mind set on something but he was like to go in and get this scar tissue out it's going to be worse than childbirth he was like i would really recommend getting an epidural and she was like okay well you're the expert and i was like yeah that sounds like the right move and and then somebody has to witness this massive eight foot needle going into her back and they i nominated me which i don't they don't know that i don't watch surgeries on youtube like i don't i'm the anti-medical guy and uh 
So you watched the needle I go in. I watched it the first time. I thought that I had to. I felt <laughs> obligated. And uh, that was crazy, man. That's a massive thing to go into a person's body. And, uh, you know, the anesthesiologist is just like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go play nine holes after this and just is not careful about it at all. But uh, Well, they were careful. They were just relaxed about it. Yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah. relaxed. Like, and like no one no should emergency. be relaxed in that environment. I mean, well, not... I mean, it's good that they're relaxed, right? I guess, but uh, I just, I didn't, I wasn't the guy to be witnessing that. I shouldn't have. So then she had to get another one later, same night, or like in uh, I, a epidural stopped working. <laughs> I had bowed to do out. it again. I bowed out on that one. Some, so let me somebody. ask you from like a dad's perspective when you're watching like your wife, like in pain, totally, I would say suffering at some point with Sarah's labor. And then she gets this like glorious epidural and she relaxes and she goes to sleep. Like, did, was that helpful for you? Was the epidural like a good thing for you? It's, I have to go on the experts. She was in a lot of pain, but I, I was like, well, what does everybody else have to say? Like, is this okay? Is this normal? So I'm paying attention, you know, uh, like Garen asking a lot of questions and trying to gather information that to me is kind of more reliable than the person that's in it. Yeah. So for her, I'm just like trying to be understanding and, you know, you can squeeze the shit out of my hand or do whatever you got to do. But, you know, it's, um, I don't know. It was new for both of us. So, was... so when delivery happened, were you a North guy or a South guy? Oh, definitely North guy until... <laughs> And to, and actually, that's part of it is like I felt like that was the more important place to be where this person is going through excruciating pain and like looking her in the eyes. And that's where she needed me is right there holding hands, you know, locked in. Um, and there's nothing to see down there. No. I've seen that. But then when 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 it was like the, those those precious seconds, like there's only how many seconds does it take for a human being to come out of a vagina I mean, only a few seconds. And I mean, don't you want to see that if it's your child? Yes. Like, I Not couldn't everybody. help it. everybody. Look at Wells. I couldn't no. help it, man. No, no, I no, couldn't no. help Hell it. Hell no. I'm the anti-medical guy, but I couldn't help it. I was already there, and I was like, it's only going to happen for like four seconds, and then it's over. So I, I you know... Apparently, I this does not sound like me at all, but apparently all the nurses and afterwards, uh, they were like, man, your husband... He was all about it. He was holding your leg up with one hand, had your hand squeezing in the other hand, and was staring, like waiting for, you know, that, that finish line crossing. You were probably crossing. squeezing her, not her squeezing. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That's probably more accurate. Now, did anybody here watch the placenta be delivered? No. <laughs> Wells is solid. No. Garen no. probably ate it. <laughs> I, I wanted you? to watch it. Garen, did you it, encapsulate but I, the placenta no, for yourself? <laughs> I, I wanted to watch, but I saw them pushing, you know, and I, I didn't. I mean, Aaron I got to see Aaron is doing it like a mashed potatoes. They, we call it like mashed potatoes where they like push on the uterus to get it. Yes, it's went. I, wish everyone I remember that because it was like the, you know, they knocked the Pitocin up. But then once the once Baker was here, I remember looking over at the machine that, you know, was pumping the Pitocin. And then that sucker had gone up even higher. And I'm like. Why is it, why are you still getting pitocin? And they're like, we you still have to contract to make this placenta come out. And I didn't. I got to see what it looked like afterwards because I wanted to. But did she encapsulate it? No, no. But Sarah did. Well, my, my Sarah did encapsulate hers. Okay, and she's probably out of pills by now, right? Because it's baby six weeks old. Just taking the last couple. Okay. What does that mean? It's where they like dehydrate the placenta and then they put it into little capsules and then the moms will ingest the placenta and it helps mm. to kind of like with milk supply. It helps to restore your iron from your blood loss. Like there's a million um, benefits to it. So this is. Okay, this is a more modern. They put it in. I've heard stories. I mean, back in yes. This, I mean, you know, back in it, like mammals, just like just a, eat it, you know. But and I'm sure, like, different cultures have different like placenta rituals, and I'm sure there are some cultures that just straight up eat it. But like 
No, in the United States, we dehydrate it and put it in a pretty capsule and you swallow it just like a vitamin. <laughs> so, yeah, so you wouldn't bad. really even know. No taste involved. I guess you I'd don't do even know those. if you're taking, you know, t- turmeric or echinacea or if you're taking placenta, you know, who knows? So, nice. um, okay. So babies are born and you guys come home that first like day. And then I just want you to talk about for and and when I'm asking this question, it's for new dads that are listening. Like Wells, and you're like right in it at six weeks. Like, what's your advice for those like first that first week? Like, what's your advice for new dads? I, I would definitely say like that first week. Uh, try try to help your wife get up as many times as you can to change the diaper when she's trying to feed them during the middle of the night. Because she's absolutely exhausted. I mean, you know, Sarah was definitely exhausted. Um, You know, I still had to work. So, you know, he would sleep from like 11 to 2. I tried to get up at 2, change him one time, and then she'd get back up at 5 or 7, depending on what it is. And Yeah. uh, But anytime you can help that way, um, it's definitely very helpful for your spouse. I mean, I feel like Sarah's kind of getting back. I mean, she's she's went start working out today. Yeah, I saw um, Wells' wife the other day, and I just sh- some women just kind of make motherhood look really easy. And Sarah is one of those people. But it makes me think: Is there something that she needs that she's not asking for, or does she is she really just doing okay? She really is just doing okay. okay. Seriously, she's just yeah. like she she was like born to be a mother. Yeah, I mean, she's just kind of got that kind of feeling about her and you know every time i'm looking at her i'm like sarah i need 10 hours of sleep tonight she's like okay i'm good and i got two today and i'm and she's good to go yeah she's also let's remind everyone that that's not like typical for all moms she's also the mom that climbed mount kilimanjaro without training so just to be clear on that one so all right garen like what's your like big advice for that first week you know coming home Hopefully you share a great relationship with your wife or your significant other. Uh, as well spoke, more of that teamwork aspect. I don't think any dads listening to this podcast, unless their wife made them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which means they probably have a pretty good relationship. My target audience is not going to be like the single dad. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, perfect. So being able to really incorporate that teamwork of the open line of communication you do everything together or it's you know it's one off so and that's how we did with baker's diaper changes during the night um i would get up and do the diaper change and then i would bring him to her so she could nurse and then we'd put him back down and once again the swaddle thing for me was always i didn't know if i was doing it too tight or too loose, so I would always Velcro just, just I, I, I just I let Madeline do that. I'll say I don't know if this is too tight or not, and she just give it to me. Pow. So um, I'm pretty. It's pretty consistent across the board that you guys would say to new dads, make sure that you have the Velcro swaddle <laughs> the, no, on board. No, no button things, and all Velcro. Yeah, it's so nice. Where I mean, I know back when you old-fashioned swaddle or what they do in the hospital still i mean it worked great but when you have that opportunity of something that simplifies the process but gives you the same that gives gives him him or her the same satisfaction that's it so derek those first nights that you know you're about to do it again so what advice do you need to give yourself do for about to go through it again i hope it's a lot different well i know it'll be different this time because i'm more confident even though I still feel like I have a lot of insecurities about being a dad because to be honest uh, Sarah's Middle Eastern and that culture is a lot more um, you know I mean a lot of people in this country would say it's not progressive it's she she feels like her role is a lot of things that I've even seen like friends and different people that look at me like I don't do enough and but she doesn't want you to do exactly exactly and that that's a cultural thing you know um and so um well there may be a few things she wants you to do yeah well yeah it's but but I get what you're saying like I guess what I'm getting at is uh 
I don't – initially, in those few weeks, coming home is really hard. It's brand new. We didn't know what we were doing. She was terrified and uh, didn't really trust me that much. Even though we were in a really good place in our relationship, uh, it just was – I'm going to jump in here, too, on um, giving up control from the mom's perspective. It's sometimes it's really difficult. And I remember my husband early on saying, Heidi, there's your way and there's my way. And they're both right. Like, and I well think it was, it was probably about swaddling. Yes. Like, I was probably like over. I probably said swaddle the baby. And then I looked over his shoulder and was like, you're not swaddling the baby. Right. And I just remember him stopping me and saying, my way your way like get you know you want me to do this and so i think that you know for moms and dads that are listening yes there there are multiple right ways there's grandma's way is right mama's way is right daddy's way is right you know and um and letting go of some of that control so that you can get help or ask for help i think is really important so this is going to lead me into um let's talk about before your baby was born what who were you and what did you love doing that you're missing right now? So, Garen. I have no problem saying this. I, I've, I, I love to work out, specifically running. That is, I love running. And it's just, it's a release. It's, it, it's it, with my com- you know, personal confidence within myself. I just, I'm a different person when I'm able to stay in shape and work out. And, you know, you think of the year before, Baker was born. I'd ran the Chicago Marathon. I ran a half in New Orleans, among a couple other races. And I remember telling a girl, uh, Hillary, if you ever listen to this podcast, you were right. <laughs> but I remember running with her and saying, you know, when, when Baker comes, I'm still going to get out and get my three, four runs in a week. And, and she said, <laughs> Talk to me when he gets here. I'm like, whatever, okay. I'm, I'm not the one having the baby. But when he came into the world, it just – I love running. That That's a great priority. Yeah, well, that priority, it, could, it goes way down on the totem pole because even still to this day – I mean, Baker's eight and a half months. Am I running again? Yes. Am I running as much as I used to? No. Uh, Does it bother me a little bit? Yes. But coming home every day when I go for a run or first thing in the morning, but instead I get to see him and play with him and watch his face light up. That's my little monster. And that is that trumps running. Listen, if I end up weighing 600 pounds... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it is well worth it to to enjoy those times and uh and and Madeline tells me all the time go run just go run but it's my self guilt where I just don't want to leave his side I just want to any going back to work I want to spend every moment I have with him that I can but we're getting to a a point now where uh you know sleeping through the night uh so i I do have the opportunity to get up in the morning get my workout in and then still experience everything so it's more of you know your priorities change and it's also a time thing like he's number one so let's keep it there and and when you're in a good spot with him like with sleeping for example and you can get up in the morning and go and you don't miss a beat yeah then i can i can resume that but it running for me was my my go-to if you could go back to the day he was born Mm -hmm. that guy that was running three or four miles would you do anything differently in regards to like would you have if you could go back would you have done more self-care through the last nine months would you have given yourself permission or do you like where you're at I like where I'm at. I have absolutely no regrets because I know every single moment that I've had in order to spend with him. With him yeah. That's number one. Like, it, I, I love my job. I love my wife. You know, obviously, my wife, uh, our dogs. But, man. <laughs> he, We're going to get to a tough question oh, in a minute on God. that one. So, Wells, um, you're six weeks in. I don't know what your life was, if it's much different than it was six weeks ago, but I know that you said you have some passions. So tell us about like what you're passionate about, what makes you happy and what, if there's anything that you've been missing over the last six weeks. 
so I, w- I would definitely say, you know, the the passions I have are not running. I have a zero point zero <laughs> sticker on my car. Okay. Um, yes, zero that is so. Funny. So my my <laughs> my, my wife runs marathons. She's a big hiker. I, on the other hand, want to travel and play golf. So I've been to Scotland and played. I've been, you know, played all over the U.S. and different open courses. You know, I, I enjoy doing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, how much at, golf have you played in the last six weeks? So I have a, a guys trip that we go at the end of March. Okay. And every year, the only time I ever really play that much is now through then. So she's still been like, Sarah's still been like, go out and hit a couple golf balls. She's like, you got to bring the trophy home. Don't embarrass our family. You know, yeah. it, so, um, you know. But I'm, Sarah's also on maternity leave right now. <laughs> so when she goes back to work. She, will be the day after I get back from that golf trip. Perfect timing. So. Perfect timing. I would love to check in with you a year from now and see, like, you know, if you are able. But my advice to you and to moms is self-care is really important, but there's also a balance, right? So, like, do you give up running or do you give up golf? No. But sometimes you have to scale it back a little bit to have some balance. But don't get away from it. Like, put it on the cal- put that golf trip on the calendar talk to your partner about it, you know, have that open communication and find that, you know, find that, that balance. That first month, you know, we, we definitely did not have that balance. I mean, it was, you know, us with trip at all times. Now it's kind of, kind of getting to that point. Like, Hey, your girlfriends are still going out to yoga on Tuesday. Why don't you go? I'll keep the baby. So yeah. we're starting to get back to our kind of normal lives again and just live that way. So yeah. it's just now getting to where we can kind of figure out, you know, hey, we still got a kid, but we still got lives going on, too. So, yeah, so important. Derek, how about you? What are some of the things that you um, now shy is two and a half years old? So you're much further down the dad road. Um, so what were some things that brought you joy and, you know, that you were passionate about? And then before you had a daughter and then are those things still in your life? Golf. Yes, I played uh, this morning because uh, they're both in Texas right now. So you got to take those opportunities. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, a really uh, good time to go yeah, play golf. Yeah. Yes. When your child is out of town. Yeah. And running too. Actually, both of you guys share uh, passions of mine. And, uh, you know, I find that if I don't, I mean, the golf isn't so much a force. That's, that's finding the time because it's an all day or multiple day activity and so it's it's about looking at the calendars and, and the logistics of that is, is tougher now but she knows it's important thank God she's a therapist that understands self care and encourages me in that way um, but you know it is it is tougher now but the running thing you know that doesn't take near as much time and it's a necessity I, I have to remind myself constantly that like you, I am so much of a worse version of myself if I'm not dead, you know, running two or three miles a day. Just get it in somehow. I mean, and it doesn't have to be that. If but something, man. I mean, some people meditate, do yoga, whatever. Where you're just well, and after six months of age, your child can go in the jogger with you. And so I've seen I Derek do. about. He, we live in the same neighborhood. And about 50% of the time, I see Derek jogging with baby Shia, um, and then about 50% of the time on your own. So it's I, I found that kind of cool, like watching you go through the neighborhood. You're getting your self-care in, and you're hanging out with your daughter. I love that. Yeah. You know? Because she loves it, too. She usually passes out within, like, two minutes of leaving the house. Yeah. I love we, it. Well, go ahead. We just started that process. So at, we got that little spurt, you know, the our yearly every year you get that one week in february that that makes you reach for summertime because the weather's so perfect yeah and i got to throw them in the stroller for a couple of runs and you know that's that's kind of where you know the that's my bonding time with him that gives madeline some time and that's something that i've definitely there and and and, and, because now she's going through becoming a stay-at-home mom which is she kind of like well said it's that's her passion that's what she wants to do and of course, I fully support that. And although she's a stay-at-home mom, she still needs her time too. So being able to take the baby, even if she it's needs for, more time, more absolutely she needs more time. And <laughs> that's so. and, and adult time. Yeah, every week. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, I, 
yeah. emphasize that with her. To, whatever you want to do, you you need to go do that. It, you have to have that that personal time. Yeah, it's great for your relationship, your marriage, and your relationship with your child, of course. Yeah, Wells, did you? Does Sarah have a jogger? So Sarah does have a jogger. Okay, it's already collect just sitting there. She's like, she's, she's, like, she's like, please let him get a stable head soon. Yeah, like, you know. I figured I was going to tell you buy it for her if she doesn't already have one. Okay, so we're kind of we're going to wrap it up here soon, but I really want to kind of frame that same question, but around your marriage and your relationship. And so, and again, Wells, you're brand new on this. Derek, they're going on baby number two, and Garen, you're about eight and a half, nine months in. So talk to me about what you are doing or what you're not doing. Like, what are you doing right? What are you doing wrong with your marriage right now? Like, how is it different than it was before the babies arrived? And then what are you doing? Do you guys go on dates? Like, just to talk. Talk to me about what it, what's going on in your lives. Just, well, had, just had my first date uh, okay. within the last week. So we within six for, weeks, you went on a date. Yep. That's amazing. Okay. So, Where'd you go? We went to Maria's. It's what a is Mex- that? Mexican restaurant, South okay. Boulevard. Okay. Best Mexican food here in Charlotte. Okay. So, okay. Derek, tell me, two and, two and a half years in, are you and Sarah still, are you dating a lot? Are you getting babysitters? Like, what it, What are you guys doing to we keep your marriage healthy? any friend, any neighbor, anyone we can uh, that wants to watch her for a couple hours and we go um you know try to do it once a month we don't really have a schedule but we're we we kind of feel it we know when we need one and yeah. so i think we're really healthy in that way and connected the dates are huge because you get the big dose and yeah i, don't know. <laughs> I did want to say something i was though, like but... i didn't know if you were going for something else there so do no, it. I say it. What's get, on your mind? Well, just, um, you know, when we were talking about uh, coming home and, like, I don't know what what young dads are feeling when they're in the thick of a moment of that's new and scary. Like, I don't know. The best thing that I've learned, I think, and it's so applicable to, like, everything is to just zoom out and realize that it is so brief. And even though it feels so intense, every experience that we now have, and I think dads and moms are so, they they get it. They just feel it. They understand this in a way that nobody else can. Is just like, what's, what's real and intense today is going to be gone, and it's going to be a new thing tomorrow. And so it's just like hang in there and zoom out. Yeah. And and I'm glad that you're saying this, Derek, because there's going to be a lot of people that are listening that when you have a baby or two babies, it takes a real toll on your marriage at some point. I, I don't care how happy you are. At some point, having children is going to take a toll on your marriage. It's going to slow down your sex life. It's going to slow down communication. Somebody's going to resent somebody. So I am I just appreciate that just you're having hang this in there and, Hang yeah. in there, and zoom only- out. So Garen, so you t- tell us about you and Madeline. Like, how's your marriage been and what have you guys been doing to, um, you know, are you dating? 100%. And yeah. uh, kind of like Will said, in the beginning, that first little period, it's almost like, you both know. Obviously, he's number one. Yeah. We've we got to get to that point. And that's one thing that I've learned along the way so far through almost nine months is um, their phases. If it's a phase of or, or steps, you know, that they go through in their life of development, uh, if it's with sleep, if it's with, you know, holding their head up, just whatever it might be. Um as they say, this too shall pass. You enjoy every minute of it, uh, but at the same time, there are certain things test you along the way, kind of like you said, Derek. Uh, but our marriage, that's one thing that we always said and we've stayed true to was dating is important. Our our marriage, if our marriage isn't successful, then, you know, that that. Your that, parenting is yeah, not going to be successful. exactly. It. Well, I'm going to do. We've got time for one more question, and I'm going to go with um, the boobs. Everyone's wife is nursed here is nursing, right? Has anyone here tasted the breast milk? Yes. Of course, yes. Of All course. three of you guys. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that's incredible! All three of you guys tried it. 
Yeah. What did it taste like? It's delicious. It's like a it's like a warm <laughs> sugar milk <laughs> kind of sort of. Yeah, mm. not bad. I prefer I also, it actually. I, I mean, and it, it, you ha- hear a lot of people drink breast milk, right? Well, I tried mine. A- I was just curious. Yeah, it was like sw- like a sweet warm milk. Yeah, I just, it's I'm, not too shabby. I'm really like I'm impressed by you guys <laughs> yeah. here. She, but now I, she's almost nine months, you know, post baby, and I mean, even today, it's like. Well, a little grab. They're still. Enjoy, I want to enjoy them. As, yeah, while they're still full. It, of while milk. they're full of goods. Yeah. yeah so, but uh, she just rolls her eyes. It's it's give and take, just like yeah. anything else, right? I definitely well. still go up and tug on them. <laughs> baby, baby might be eating. And I'm gonna be like, well, I'll just grab them while the baby's eating. You know. I love you guys. We've been talking for an hour and 25 minutes, and we are getting kicked out of the podcast studio because we have gone over our time. So right now, the very last thing is um, if you had could tell new dads the one thing to not say to your partner ever, like what got you in trouble and what would you say don't say out loud? Madeline's somebody that bounces it should bounce back from pregnancy. I mean, she looks amazing. Even I mean, you know, two months afterwards, she looked like she did before. Uh, but I said in a nice way, because I love to run, I said, go out and get a work you know, go out and get a workout in. Go uh, get go get a run, go go walk. Well, of course to a woman that might be a little different. That's what are you trying to say? And it's like, honey, you look great, but I'm thinking exercise. That's what I said. Go, go out and get you some exercise. And I remember getting the death stare. No, was she like, interpreted oh, shit. it. Yeah, so I learned right there just to uh, to choose my words wisely. You're not allowed to say the truth, like yeah. in some ways, because uh, I mean, the emotional difference is what I notice, and I, and I really would would say try not to say. Um, you're being emotional. The pregnancy is making you more emotional. If just ignore the pregnancy part, say what you got to say, but don't attach it to the pregnancy. Because I mean, even though there's some very clear differences in this person and the way that they interact with you, um, just try not to make that connection because they don't want to believe that. And well, since you're new in this, I'm going to give you some advice and everyone else listening, don't engage. So when we're going crazy, we're tired, we haven't slept, and we're saying things that don't really make sense, do not engage. Just, okay, just walk away because like you said, Derek, earlier, zoom out. The moment's going to be gone. In five minutes, she's going to be over it. Do not engage. Everybody got it? You guys are awesome. Thanks so much for being on the Birth Story podcast and um, for helping out new dads. Thanks, Addy. Thank you, Addy. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered.